So uh, I know it's the last session. Thank you for sticking it out. Is anybody awake? Maybe. I was thinking about doing some sort of stretching exercise, but that would get weird. Um, but thank you again. My name is Andy Weber. I work at uh, SIG, which is a trading company outside uh, Philly and Bella Kinwood. So primarily, my day-to-day -day job is, is C++. Um, specifically, you know, low latency C++ trading systems, um, both on Windows and Linux. One of those rare people that actually just does both. Um, so anyway, uh, how many people here program in C++ all the time? How many have at some point in the past? How many with C++ 11? All right, good. So I'll do a little bit of background. It sounds like most of you people, you know, the fundamentals haven't changed that much. So it'll be a little bit of a refresher, and then we'll do uh, we'll do a tour. Actually, I think that's yeah. There we go. We'll do a tour of a lot of new features. I hopefully have some meaty stuff. We'll we'll get through that. I have a little optimization example, um, pretty short, and uh, we'll see how much time we have. Feel free to, to ask questions. We, we do have a mic, um, just so stuff gets on the recording. I'll try to repeat if you, if you don't get the mic. So, what are we doing here? So, Strushtip actually had a quote, and I don't have the exact quote. This is not you know, a talk that's intended to start a language flame war. And please don't attack me directly. This is my, my first actual conference talk. Um, but e even Struship, the creator of C++, says, you know, use the right language for the job. C++ is not the right language for every job. I think the goal of the, the standardization committee is to expand the number of jobs where it's a viable and or good option. Uh, so to make it easier for novices and all the way to ex experts that are trying to control every little detail of what the machine's doing. Um, but we use other languages at SIG. Um, but you know my day-to-day -day bread and butter is C++, so that's what we'll, we'll talk about. So when is C++ the right tool? Well, first and foremost, performance. Now, that being said, I really enjoyed the Rust talk earlier. I'll be looking into that. I enjoy that there are new languages coming out that, that are trying to attempt to hit some of the same sweet spot that C++ hits you know, in a, in a, in a fresher, uh, fresher language. So I think it's interesting. But C++ definitely has a lot of momentum behind it. In performance, you know, that's, that's, its, that's its, uh, its primary goal. It was one of the original cross-platform languages. Obviously, C came before it, but the C, C++ compiler is available on almost every platform that exists. It's usually what the OS is built in. There you go. It's extremely expressive, um, and that is continuing to to just you know increase over time, and uh, it's one of the, the things I like the best about the language. Correctness, obviously you can uh, shoot yourself in the foot with a bazooka with C++, um, but hopefully as the language evolves, uh, a lot more of the correctness checking can become you know opt-in over time. It's obviously not built into the language in terms of rules that have to run all the time. The same code that you wrote <laughs> 13 years ago in C++ will compile today almost definitely and run and do basically what it did. Hopefully actually a little bit faster than it did before, but um, there are a lot of new features and things that you can opt into to increase the inherent correctness in your system. So C++, kind of a refresher, statically typed, compiled, well, natively compiled. My very favorite thing, deterministic object lifetime, I, I don't really want to deal with a language that doesn't have that, at least uh, I don't want to deal with it very much. And a core tenant, pay for what you use. So there are tons of features. Some people say too many. But you can pick and choose what you want. And when you don't use a feature, generally, that thing is free. You just don't have to worry about it. And uh, increasingly, compile time compilation. So that was kind of accidentally supported through template metaprogramming. Uh, which was extremely terrible and ugly, but was useful uh, for a lot of things. But now it's more directly supported with uh, constexpr. You can actually really do things at compile time. So multi-paradigm, 
This is stuff you already know, object-oriented, generic, functional, procedural, and any combination thereof, which is where it gets really interesting is you combine uh, different, you know, different kind of uh, paradigms and, and make your own. So hopefully everybody knows this, but this is, this is a key piece of C++. Are you on the stack or are you on the heap? So this has to do with deterministic destruction. That's what I call it. Um, REII is another pretty unwieldy acronym for it. We have a function, which means we have a scope. We have a stack variable, which in this case is a lock on some sort of resource. Well, at the end of that scope, that lock goes away. Every single time, you know exactly what's going to happen. In this case, we don't want that to happen, and we can allocate on the heap, which puts it in some other spot in memory, which says, you know what? In this case, the scope here is for the actual pointer. And when the pointer goes away, that doesn't mean our lock goes away. Obviously, this thing's leaking, so don't do this. But you know, as to illustrate, illustrate an example, so our resource continues to be locked for forever at the end of this. Make sense? OK. So old school, probably the, the, the C++ that you're familiar with. Had good performance. That's why people used it. Um, had a lot of boilerplate. We've all written the same code over and over again that's just annoying, and I would prefer to not do that anymore. And in fact, these days I don't as much, which is good. Uh, but that was kind of the, the state of things. Standard library was OK, but it didn't have that much in it. That was, that was one of the primary drivers of other languages, was a huge standard library with lots of interesting tools that you don't have to write yourself. And you had Boost on top of it. Some shops uh, never used Boost. Uh, Boost was almost a standard library incubator, and they continue to be. Um, they obviously couldn't make uh, language changes, but they were able to really advance the state of the art in C++ just through library usage and some crazy, crazy templates and preprocessor macros and all sorts of stuff to really do proof of concept uh, libraries that were honestly very useful, many of which were almost taken wholesale into the new standard. So what do we, what do we have now? We have even better performance than we had before without changing any code in many cases. And I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, it's much easier to write. I would never, ever want to go back to writing the old, the old C++. It would, it would be a little painful. Clearer, more expressive code, uh, more concise frequently, and lots of new work rolling in. They basically decided to change the way that they were going to do standardization. They went from 98, really 03 was like the bug fix release, to 11 without releasing any new standard features, essentially. That's way, way, way too long. The rest of the world kind of went by as that was happening. They were doing a lot of work, but it wasn't in the hands of users in terms of an actual standard. So they've completely changed. Now they're on a rolling schedule. They call it like fence post schedule. So we had 11. 14 was a bug fix with a couple good new features. 17 is going to have new stuff. There's going to either be 19 or 20. So uh, lots of progress happening. So let's look at some of this, this new code. Some of it's simple, some of it's complicated. All right, one of the most basic things you see in a lot of new style modern code is auto. So really simple example. What type is i in this case? i is in it. It's interesting with auto, you do uh, tend to learn the rules about what actual literals are available with, uh, in more detail. So 10 isn't in here. S. S here is a const care pointer. So anybody know what this is? So this is a standard string, which is enabled by using the user-defined uh, literals, which are new. And uh, you have to opt into them. Uh, you can write your own. They also have uh, user-defined literals for things like microseconds and milliseconds, that kind of stuff. So here here's, starts to get a little bit tricky and really where it becomes even more advantageous. I have a vector of doubles. Hopefully you kind of know what that is. Um, and here I want 
cbegin, which is a little bit new. It's the const iterator to the beginning. So what is iter in this case? Iter is something that you didn't really want to type, which is standard vector double const iterator. So this is useful. Super useful feature, initializer list. So we have a vector of integers again. I just want to load data into it. Now, maybe in production code, this doesn't make that much sense. You usually have files with data, or you're getting it over the network, or something like that. Um, but really, this does come in handy uh, really often, not necessarily with numbers, but with subcomponents of objects and things. It's extremely useful. I'll show you a different example. But this kind of load a bunch of data in, very useful for unit tests. My unit tests look like blocks of data getting loaded in and asserted and tested and things. So here we have an example struct. Um, I haven't written a constructor. I haven't done anything. Uh, in this case, uh, we just got done the NCAA tournament. So we have basketball players and numbers. And I have uh, essentially a hash map of strings to a vector of players. So this is like a team list, pretty naive team list. I just want to load it with data. So you can see it's a little, it's a little tricky with nested curly braces. There's a lot of curly braces. But what you essentially have is nested initialization all the way down with infinite you know, recursion, like as far as it goes. So this is the string, which is the key. And then we have a subobject, which is a list, which is the vector, which is a list of things that go in the vector. The things that go in the vector are players, and the player is a name and a number. And so if you get all the brackets right, just initializes all the way down. And uh, they actually were a little bit conservative about when they allowed this in C++ 11. They've started to relax the rules a little bit uh, in terms of enabling it in the case where you had in member initializers and, and some more complicated things, because it's so useful. I really don't like writing constructors anymore if I don't have to. I mean, for, for simple, you know, just blocks of data, it, it makes it really easy. Along with all of these things, you want to loop over stuff inevitably. So how do we, how do we, how do we make sense of, of, that, of that set of basketball teams that we had? By the way, I don't know if you noticed, but Villanova, champions, Terrapins, best team ever. Obviously not this year, but. All right, so we want to iterate over our team list. Now this is C++, so you have to make choices all the time, but they're choices that I like. So in this case, I want a reference, not a const reference. So, and I don't care really what this thing is. So I say auto ref, that's, that gets me a non-const reference to whatever is in there which in this case is a team list value, which is the vector of uh, players. And then I want to iter iterate over the players. So I do the same thing. And in this case, I can update the stats on the player. Simple example, but really I have, I have changed my ways into writing almost no other for loops, but these kind of for loops. And I'll show you some really cool examples in a minute of uh, how you can, you think, well, this is too simple. What, 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 what can you do with this? So lambdas, these things all play together, by the way. You'll see it kind of grows together. Lambdas existed in other languages, and we thought in C++, why can't we have them? I just have to write these functor objects all over the place, and they're terrible. I don't want to use this with the standard algorithms and the standard library. Very painful, but not anymore. So in this case, I have a vector of integers. This is a range library, which I'll talk a little bit more about, um, but this basically sorts the vector. Okay. Well, what if I want to sort it the, the opposite way? Now, normally I would have to, I mean, there is standard greater, which we could use, which was an, a functor that could do this, but it's kind of annoying to use, so I just want to do it myself. All right. Sort has an optional second parameter, which is a lambda. So in this case, the lambda that they want to use gives you two integers, two members of whatever the container is, and you need to compare them. So in this case, all I want to do is get x and y, but reverse and use greater than instead of less than. So 
couple things here. This is called the Lambda Introducer. You can put stuff in here, which is really cool. I'll show you an example. Um, I define this for ints, but I don't have to in C++14. I can actually just say auto here, and it will deduce the, it, it, effectively, it actually creates a template function. This is really generating a functor. The other thing I really love about this language is that what this does is not magical. Literally, it is as if it created boilerplate for you. I mean, it's syntactic, you know, sugar. But this is creating a functor object that has a member function that takes these, it's, it's just a regular function. But if you put auto here, it would be a template function. I don't have to say the return type because it can, it can now deduce it based on, I have a single statement, what is the type of that statement? And so it's pretty concise. I didn't write auto because auto is actually longer than int. I didn't really need it. Great. I'm moving along swiftly. Yeah. Um, I just wondered, uh, so it's been a long time since I've done it in C++, but if you play auto in your, uh, is that an int? Um, do you, um, does it have to be compatible with the type with an operator, uh, greater than operator? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, um, I'll talk more about this too, but in this case, you would get this standard template instantiation error with a, a good ream of error code or, you know, compiler errors that eventually said there is no greater than operator for standard string. Actually, it probably is, but something else. You know what I mean? Yep. All right. So let's put some of this stuff together, and this is more like real code that you might write. Well, it's still kind of a weird example. I have a similar vector. But in this case, I have some other stuff, like I have a multiplier and I have a filter. So here, I want to go through my vector so that the colon here, you know, the left-hand side is, is the uh, variable. The right-hand side is a big expression. So I want my vector and I'm piping it to something called view reverse. Now this is real code. Eric Niebler wrote ranges library. It's, it's getting standardized. You have pieces of this already in Boost, but this is more from Eric Niebler's library. So basically, this just gives me a reversed view of this thing. And then I want to do something else with it. I want to transform it in this case. So transform takes a lambda, which obviously would take a, you know, a member of the vector one at a time and do something with it. Well, I just want to multiply it by my multiplier. Now remember, I talked about this lambda introducer. In this case, what I'm saying is, hey, copy this mult so that I have it in this scope. I can use it. Um, there are a few different options. I could capture it by a reference. Um, now you can capture it by a different copy, or you can have arbitrary expressions, actually, to, to capture. Um, but in this, in this case, it's pretty simple. I'm just capturing a copy of this value. Now, you think you're generating a functor here, similar to you had functors before. And essentially, it's saying, in, I have a constructor, and the constructor takes uh, an int by value, and then I have a member of it. That's literally what the compiler is generating for you. You just don't have to do it. So I can return my multiplied value. And I want to do some filtering. So kind of similar, except in, now instead of a transform function, I have a predicate. And my predicate, just I want to filter things that are you know, below my filter value. So that's it. Um, obviously, it's, it's happening in order. So I'm reversing it, then multiplying, then filtering. I could, I could change that. And this kind of style, I think, is, is really powerful in terms of its composability, because obviously here I'm chaining these things. And together, this creates a lazy, evaluated thing that can be infinitely long, it can be do arbitrary code, um, and is, in my point of view, you know, much safer than the old style of using iterators, of manually calculating the length of things, and, and this will just basically be more safe more of the time. And I find it easier to reason over when I'm, when I'm looking at the code. Questions? Um, 
No, I think the pipe operator here is essentially generating another functor. So you know, you're getting you're getting kind of like a nested chain of of functions. Especially now, I didn't talk about it, but um, C++ 11 introduced standard functions, so functions can be captured um, as real objects. Now, interestingly, lambdas can return other lambdas. So you don't actually have to store the thing in a function unless you need to refer to it later. And in this case, it's all one expression, so probably it's not even really stored. It's just you know, in place. Is, is the first value in the vector going through the whole pipeline before the second value, or do all the values go through the reverse? I guess they go. And then all the values go through the transform. Well, there are certainly values don't, that don't make it through. I would, I would think that as, as you're dereferencing, effectively this, in the end, generates some sort of iterator that can iterate through this big functor thing. And I'm assuming that when you dereference the first iterator, it's probably going, churning, until it gets at least one value. So, but I, I doubt that, I think you would probably be hitting the first value in reverse order that actually made it through. You know, you wouldn't get to the end yet. Because you could, instead of the actual vector here, I could say, like, give me primes and, and throw it into here. So you can't, you know, it has to be really, Lazily evaluated. All right. So this, I, I go a little bit into more detail about uh, move operations and R value references. It's, um, it's one of the banner features of C++11, and it's something that you get for free when you just recompile your code, uh, because the new standard library supports it. And it's a little bit confusing. I don't go into super detail, but hopefully it, it makes sense. So let's say I have a big buffer someplace. And in this case, since it's standard vector, it's a dynamic array, it's heap allocated, so it's like two meg on the heap someplace. Well, the old, old school way, well obviously without auto, is that I would just get a copy of this thing. And if I wanted to fill it up, I would have to pass it in as a reference or do some crazy stuff like that, really just annoying stuff. But now what I can do is say that I want to move this. Now this is doing something that makes sense once you understand it. But in effect, in terms of usage, you're saying, I don't want this big VEC anymore. I don't care about it. I'm not really going to use it anymore. But what I would like to do is move its contents into some other object. In this case, another literal, another object of a, of a standard vector. And since standard vector is heap allocated, all it has to do is swap a pointer, which is you know, obviously very fast. This is useful in other, for other idioms in other ways. Um, and in fact, one thing that you can do, which is super awesome, is now return big objects from like a factory. Because in this case, here I'm, I have to state here that I want to move this. Because it's, it's in my scope, how would it know otherwise? So I have to say, I don't care about this thing anymore, move out of it. Here, I don't have the definition of this, but let's say big object factory function just returns a value of some big object. That by default, the compiler knows that that's a temporary value. And temporary values are always R value references and can be moved from because they're by definition ephemeral. So this thing always moves. Another really interesting thing is that you can have objects that are not copyable, because it doesn't make sense, which is what you had before, but you can move them, because having a single valid object that points to some real thing, like an OS resource, like a socket or a thread, does make sense. So you, it really enables um, you know, usage patterns that, that literally didn't exist before. So is the, the basic, like the uh, best practice now to just return large there's obvious, the community is, is uh, dynamic, so there's still argument over it, but in general, yes. There are always you know, cases where it's a little bit more messy, um, but that's what I do now. I mean, frequently, the compiler is smart enough to like, completely elide it anyway. RBO still applies, right? Yes, 
Yeah. So, right, return value optimization was something that, <laughs> it's funny, this is one of the first things in C++ that you end up wanting to try. You do your naive example where you have a destructor and you're like, see out destructed in my destructor, and you compile that thing, it never gets called anyway. Because the compiler was smart enough to have not made a copy to begin with, even you know, before C++11. Um, at least in the really simple test cases that you end up writing to try something out. Because return value optimization, named return value optimization kicked in. So to actually test it, sometimes you have to pass into GCC, for instance, uh, dash F uh, no elision, like no constructor elision, something like that. Which basically says like, don't optimize this away yet, so I can try this cool thing. But it, obviously it comes into play in other circumstances where RVO didn't, didn't work for some reason. So, so how do you use this? Just as a really simple example, I have some Q class that takes a T, and what you would have had before was, was a const ref, reading it backwards, which is the one true way of doing it. Uh, so I have a reference to a const T, and obviously I'm gonna have to copy it in here. Like how else are you gonna get it in this queue? This is the new thing. So ampersand, ampersand means that this is an R value reference to a T. Notice it's not const. So this is something that I know I can steal the guts out of. I know I can do whatever I want because this object nobody's gonna use anymore by contract. So, I mean, typically here I would tell T to move itself because people can write move constructors. So as you had before, regular constructor, copy constructor, copy assignment, you now would have move constructor and move assignment where it's like, oh, I'm a vector, steal the other guy's data, done. But here as a user of whatever T is, Maybe it supports move, maybe it doesn't. That's kind of like a tricky thing about in the case before where I called move on big vec. Well, I know vector supports move, so it's good. What if this was some other object and it didn't actually support moving? Maybe it's not heap allocated. Maybe it doesn't make sense to move it. There are some objects where it, it only makes sense to copy it because it's, it's really a value. Well, this thing will still work, but it will copy. So. So the code, you know, you can use it as if it will move, but sometimes it's not as efficient. Excuse me. So if, you really, if you're in a context where you really care that move, in fact, is actually enabled for a type, you can do some type introspection and figure it out. But normally, you kind of write hoping it will be. It will just be better if it is. In this case, here, if I can move out of it, then great. So if I was passing in, let's say, a temporary generated from some calculation or something, I would get into this move-enabled version of push. In fact, vector has pushback that looks just like this. Um, and even though I would try to move the object in here, if it didn't support it, it would copy. So, but I would still be getting into the move-enabled you know, enabled version of the function. Questions about that? Um, yeah, yeah, the, 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 the fact that this is a template class, it has nothing to do with it. If you, if you wanted to write a, a function that took some explicit big object as, as a move, then you could do that. It's just that with a, I couldn't make a non-templated queue. I, I couldn't write it. My brain, my, my hands didn't do it. Make sense? In fact, let's say you had a move only type like a thread you could have some sort of thread pool where you had a function that was like absorb thread and it started to manage a bunch of threads for you. You could throw a thread into it and maybe the only interface to that would be the R value reference version because you can't take a copy of the thread. And that, that function effectively becomes a sync function for threads and only threads. Cool. So now we'll get into some of the more tricky stuff. Actually, smart pointers. Not tricky. But it is move enabled, so I had to do it after that. So super handy, unique pointer. Unique pointer is 
like the guy that killed Auto Pointer. Auto Pointer is dead. And it has, is actually deprecated and will be removed. It might be removed in 17, I'm not sure. Um, but unique pointer is what auto pointer could have been, should have been, if they actually had moved semantics at that point in the, in the language. And what a unique pointer is, is kind of just what it says. I have a pointer to, to a new integer that's five, and I can only have a single thing pointing to that value at any given time. So this is by definition not shared state. So in this case, just as I said, you might have a function where you sync values into it for some reason. I am syncing this value of p into this other function. So I know that that value will be owned by the other function at this point. It's a literal transfer of, of heap ownership. And then I'm, I don't have to deal with it anymore because I moved into that function. There's also make unique, which uh, if I have time, I'll, I'll talk about make unique and make shared. Cool. It's a cool optimization here. So uh, shared pointer is similar to unique pointer, except you can have multiple pointers pointing to the same object. Um, it's atomically locked. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's useful for, for what you, you need to do sometimes. But in both of these cases, you probably don't want to be doing this all that much anyway. Unique pointer is actually really useful as a literal ownership object. Shared pointer means that you, would share, you have shared state going on. You know, you might need it in different systems, but obviously it gets a little bit more hairy. You have the normal problems associated with shared state at that point. Um, the, the pointed to object in the shared pointer is not locked in any way. So if you want to deal with that, you still have, as, as per usual, you have full control over it, which uh, does not necessarily give you protection by, by default. So make shared. Make shared actually does a cool thing. In the case of a shared pointer, you have the real object here, and then you need some resource blocks in place to have the atomic count. And actually, you can have weak pointers too, which don't keep the reference alive, um, but you can see if the thing is still alive from under it. Well, shared pointer does a nice optimization where it, it does only a single allocation for the object and the resource block together. So it's only one allocation instead of two. Plus, it's actually more exception safe. I don't have an example for that. Does that make sense? All right. So I added this slide recently. This is actually specifically C17, because what we have here is called a fold expression. But it makes variadix actually a lot easier to use, so that's why I used it. I had this problem literally in production code where we had printf and people were passing things into printf that were not specifically allowed. But yet somehow for a long time it worked and it printed the thing the right thing. But of course, as is true normally with undefined behavior, you upgrade your compiler, you do something that should be simple and suddenly your code just starts breaking every, everywhere. So what I wanted to do was literally find every place in my code where people were doing this. And in my case, it was an easy uh, thing to essentially write my own replacement that dispatched to printf, but did compile time type checking on the values that people were passing in. So this syntax is a little weird. It takes some getting used to. But we have a template function here, and that dot, dot, dot makes this into, it's called a template pack. So this can be zero or more different types. Zero being very special, obviously. Uh, so zero or more types are passed into this. And in this case, it's actually a meta function because it's uh, doing type checking. So there's no actual uh, function involved, but I'll show you in a second. So what this does, it says, I want to take these bunch of types, and you know what? I want to just do a type check on them. So in this case, I want to check if it's arithmetic or if it's a pointer. And those are the types that I'm allowed to throw into printf. If you're a C aficionado and you know some esoteric printf thing that I'm not checking here, this works for us. Um, and so if it's either arithmetic or a pointer, it passes. And it's interesting because 
with variadic templates, you don't know how many, I mean, you can find out how many types you got passed in, but you normally don't really actually want to know. But you might need a base case because you're essentially doing recursion. So um, in this case, this pretty much textually throws out these things for all the types that are passed in as the template argument with the base case of true. So I'm assuming true, unless one of these things fails, then the whole expression will fail. And throwing all sorts of new stuff in here, this is evaluated at compile time explicitly because I'm saying it's a constant expression. So const expert here says this is a compile time constant that's evaluated using this fold expression. And the dot, dot, dot here, so it's like and dot, 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 and true. It's kind of weird syntax, but that's what it is. Now, the old non-folding variadics were similar to this, except you would essentially use recursion. You could like pop off your first type, check it, and dispatch to yourself with one fewer type in the list, and you'd essentially recurse up and end up in a base case of true. Where exactly is the recurring, or is it just built into the expression at this point? The fold? The fold, it literally is this and dot 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 and. Yeah. I actually had to look this up today, because we don't have a production C17 compiler yet. But um, this is actually in Clang 3.6, which I already had, which was great. All of these things, Clang, GCC, Visual Studio, um, are being super aggressive about, optim about, about coming out with the features either pretty much after they're standardized or frequently before they're standardized in various forms to, to try them out, you know, to really get some, some real, real world use on them to get feedback. Um, and it's really, it's really a cool time to be a C++ developer with these three great compilers, honestly, just literally competing and trying to one-up each other in terms of features, and, uh, and it's really making the language better. So how do we use this thing? So this is my printf. This is a regular variadic function. So same thing, I'm getting any number of t's here, and I'm actually getting them passed in as values. So you can call printf, you know, Andy, printf, one, two, three, four, five. It can take any number of parameters. So once I do this, I want to make sure that all the types are the right types. So here I can just static assert that my allowed per, for printf is true. And this dot, dot, dot here, the, this is the pack. This is getting the pack passed in. But the dot, dot, dot on this side says, hey, expand the pack here. So really what you're getting is like basically a textual allowed for printf you know, const care star and, and, and you know, double my, my class, which should break. And we'll get a compile time error. So this was pretty cool in production when I just enabled this and then every spot in the code that was doing the bad thing broke and there were a lot of them. So I don't know how I would, I, how I would have found them otherwise. Concepts is, is something new. Um, which is not actually going to make it into 17, but it's going to be its own TS. And a TS is kind of like, hey, there's a really big feature that's going to be super usable, or hopefully super usable, but it's big enough that we need to try it out for a while, almost as like a beta branch of the language. So we're going to specify it in terms of TS. Compilers will implement it, but it's not part of the actual standard yet. And once we get some runtime on it, because it's complicated enough that we're not sure we got it right on the first pass, will kind of bring it back in to the trunk uh, after we've gotten some, some real world use and, and know what to fix if we need to fix anything. But this is, this is pretty sweet. And this is shipping in GCC 5.1, I think. So this is super naive, binary search. And in this case, I don't know what kind of container this is. It could be a linked list. Why you would do a binary search on a linked list, I don't know, but this is, this is the example. So for a linked list or for some sort of arbitrary container, my iterator here, all I can do is go forward, because this is just a forward iterator in this case. So this is terribly inefficient, but this is the, basically the best thing I can do given that I don't know what kind of container this is. 
Now, the people that are used to iterators in the STL know that they kind of got around this a little bit, but this is kind of a motivating example regardless. So it would be really nice if I could say, you know what, this is the really bad version, but I would like to write a much better version of this for containers that I know are contiguous. <laughs> this is still a template function because I don't know really what type this is, but I know it's a type that conforms at least to a certain set of requirements. Now maybe contiguous container might be um, a, in that, that set of requirements is a concept. So contiguous container might actually be in the standard as a concept, which is any given type either conforms to or does not conform to the requirements of that concept. And you know, contiguous container, you can imagine what they might be. But in the face of this, I know that I can just pop my iterator into the middle of the structure because the thing is just sitting there in memory in a block. So this is awesome and provides the ability to do the whole partial ordering and overloading of functions that you want based on kind of different features of the objects that you're, of the types that you're trying to deal with in like a totally ordered and, and good way. And I think it's gonna transform the language, but they really wanna get it right, so um, it's not gonna be in 17, but it is coming. That's it for the, the tour. And I have a real quick optimization thing, and we will have time for some more questions if we want. Any question about any of, of those features? Can you go back to that first, um, I think, that hash table that you had? It was sure. The initial one that you showed. This? Yeah, so the, the, the types to find in that little unordered map, they also can be what up? Similar here in C++? Well, if, if I were, if, if this thing were in the context of another template, like a template function or a template class, then, then I have duck typing style types coming in at me, and I could forward those through to here. So if I had some sort of um, other class that had a template type argument, and I needed an unordered map of strings to that thing, I could clearly put, you know, if this was like class T player type or something, I could pass T in here, and the whole thing would only get instantiated once somebody was actually using it with real concrete types. So the templates can be as deep as they need to be. You know, they, it's basically, uh, you can have the generic template as far as you need to. Eventually, you, you're gonna need concrete types someplace. And then the whole template and sub-templates get instantiated. Cool. So why does SIG use this in particular? Well, this is a really naive example, but it's kind of cool. So let's say I have like a really bad POW implementation. So it works on whatever numeric type. I'm basically like looping and doing the exponent here, doing the multiplication. It's pretty boring. And I, I want to use it. So, so I'm doing pow of 10 to the 6. And then I'm just doing some loop where I go through and loop and multiply my, my i by the constant and store it. Well, one thing we can do, it's not, not, not conclude yet, but one thing we can do is mark this as a const expert function. Because I'm not doing anything with any external side effects here. And the requirements on what you can do and not do in a context for function are more and more relaxed. You can actually instantiate objects and do all sorts of stuff, and it literally can be running at compile time. So in this case, the actual code's the same, but it's running at compile time uh, in terms of the POW. Because here, I'm saying, well, I want to evaluate that, that this thing at compile time. There's, there's no reason it can't be because all the data's here. So I just want to do that at compile time and then I'm going to do my loop. Do you have to be able to use it at compile time if you put the const expression there or, or can it be like? If, if you put const expr on a function, let's say, 
What you do in the function must conform to only the things that are allowed to do at compile time. But you can use the function at runtime too. Okay. So you don't have to have multiple implementations of the same thing. You have to limit your implementation to stuff that can be run at compile time. And so here, I had to decorate this with a const expert also, because otherwise, I think it probably would have definitely run at runtime. But I'm saying, actually, this thing is a const expert. This can then run at compile time, and I have the constant. But this will, I could use it in, at runtime, too. Yeah. So, no, still not concluding. All right, let's look at assembly. So this is with optimization turned off. I don't profess to know what all of this means, but I do know what some of it means. And basically, what you have here is like a pretty standard loop. Now, one thing is, there's 10 to the 6th in un unoptimized assembly, because I said do this at compile time. So there it is. Well, we have a vector constructor, and then we have our basic loop. So here's jump to exit based on comparing to 8. We have our operator brackets. We do the multiplication. And then we increment our index and jump back. So this is the loop. All right. This is, this is a pro tip. GCC, if you're, if you're writing C++ code and it's doing something different in release than it did in debug, different in optimization than it, it did without, this dash F dump tree all gives you a ton of files where it's basically exposed to you the internals of what GCC did at every single optimization step. So you can see the code as it was in their internal format called Gimple before any optimization, this one, this one, this one, and you end up with the optimized code. And it's a little bit inscrutable because it's kind of the internals of what every optimization step did. By the way, there are tons of them, like 150 optimization steps. But you can see, oh, you know, this loop unrolling here, I can see this is where my code gets messed up. Probably I'm doing something that's not standard, that's not guaranteed to work, or possibly there's a compiler bug, but you can see where it happened, which is really informative, and kind of get a peek into how the optimizations actually work. And this came for me uh, in terms of finding strict aliasing bugs, which I could talk your ear off about. So let's, let's get the optimized code. So the optimized code, given such a super naive example, is basically loop unroll, that whole thing. Oh, just, I have the values, load them. So the const expert gave us the initial constant, but with real optimization, it just says, oh, I know what you're doing, and lays it all out. So that's, that's why we use it. And I like any language that can do that. So I hope, hope you learned something. Um, I encourage you to go out and experiment. GCC 5.1, Clang 3.8, or whatever it is now. Visual Studio has a free community edition. Their C, tool, their C++ tools you're going to be able to install without Visual Studio itself. Microsoft's really upping their game recently, which is great. Uh, have fun doing it, obviously. And profit. So oh, thank you. Any questions? Structured bindings are concepts. Structured bindings are concepts? Or which one first? Uh, what do you mean by structured bindings, actually? Uh, it's a new proposal um, for a something similar to pattern matching, um, where they can do a matching of uh, tuples. Um, there's a paper on it. I don't know. It cool. looks really interesting to me. So I was like, does anyone else have any opinions on it? I wonder, I think, uh, did that get like, basically it might get voted into 17 at the uh, next meeting? I think they're still working on the designs for it. So yeah. it's, it's definitely not a 17 kind of thing, but it's yeah. like concepts, something that might be. Well, concepts better. in terms of the TS is, is like available now. Uh, the TS isn't ready for this yet, so it's still cooking. Cool. Good question. I have to look it up. Anybody? If you want to, I, uh, I have a, uh, well, there's further reading on the slides when you get them. 
but I have some tidbits about some new stuff that just got voted in. Real, real preview. So parallelism TS, which is essentially STL with auto parallel, parallelism built in, so either multi-core or vectorized, got voted in and is in 17. Uh, file, system, file system TS, which is very similar to, to boost file system if you've ever used it, but basically copy files, make symlinks, iterate over directories, that kind of stuff, which you, know, you would think would be in the standard, actually will be uh, in 17. This is really cool. This got, it's probably gonna make it. So this is basically static if. So compile time if. Where basically, maybe I have a function and I want two different implementations. Normal C++, you would have done some overloading to make that work with, with concepts, potentially. But now here, I can, in the body of the function, basically say, you know what, this scope is true and will run if a type conforms to this, or whatever static uh, variable, or you know, static uh, Boolean expression. Or I can do some other implementation. So that's cool. This is really interesting. If you've ever used you know, standard make pair, you know that the constructor of a type doesn't itself do template de deduction because the type has to know what the template types are before it gets instantiated. So you have a function which does do deduction, which then create a type for you. Well, you end up having that all, all over the place. They're gonna simplify it basically so that the actual constructor can just do the deduction ahead of time. So that should work. That's like regular standard pair. Um, this is really interesting. Left to right order of function parameter evaluation. Deterministic. The reason they didn't do that, what's that? You're just like, well, that's, not, that's not a thing yet. It's like, yes, that's not actually. <laughs> so the reason they didn't do that to begin with was because some really old architectures, doing it left to right was really slow. And I think it's like super old ARM or super old PowerPC or something. Basically, that's mostly irrelevant these days. So they can actually standardize because all of the good modern architectures where speed actually matters and people care do the normal way anyway. So that since it's basically converged, they're, they're standardizing it. So that, that'll clear up some things. So what's left, uh, not in 17, ranges. You can get Eric Niebler's uh, range v3 and try some of it out. It kind of relies on concepts, but I think he worked around it so you can actually use it. Um, concepts I mentioned, networking uh, is roughly based on Boost ASIO, so that's very early on, um, but you know, we should have a networking library built in. Uh, really interesting is modules. Modules is effectively pre-compiled headers on steroids, including some actual better static checking. So one of the controversial pieces of it are that uh, macro definitions will not necessarily be exported across module boundaries which kind of like C developers like blows their minds, uh, but actually will make things much safer and de more deterministic. Um, it's pretty early on, although they've, they think they've come to an agreement on the design of it, and it's shipping in Visual Studio 2015. Like you can try it. Um, and it should even make template compile times faster than they were because you get a binary blob for a template that you can just read in as opposed to the, all the textual stuff that you had to do before. So, I mean, for, for non-templates, it should be way faster, as you might have noticed with pre-compiled headers, but even templates will, should be better. So, a lot of, a lot of stuff happening. Uh, is the goal for the modules TS such that uh, modules that are compiled by, say, one compiler can be consumed by another compiler? I don't think that part of modules is a standard ABI which a standard ABI is something else that they want to do. Uh, but the reason that they haven't is because it's really hard. <laughs> right, yes. That would be great. Um, but I think their thought for modules is that there are things that are not part directly of doing modules, but maybe will become technically much, like actually feasible if if there is a standardized module interface. And in fact, the, the binary format, I think it's gonna be based on clang something something, 
but the, the actual format of the module file will be standardized. So it should really, you know, be interesting what comes up after that based on, no, it's like, well, if you have everything in modules, now you can do this stuff and blah, 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 optimizations and, and such. Well, thanks for listening. Oh, one more. So are you using this in your production code or is it more of like, okay, I, I, you mentioned that like you're verifying those prints out. So you could, you could do this on the side, but you're working with trading engines. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Complex and, and critical. Yeah. So you, you know, okay, Seventeen's coming out next week. What are you going to start? Are you well, it's an interesting in an enterprise environment, and I could probably talk for a long time about the struggles of that. Um, I mean, not, obviously I didn't go into every new feature, particularly because some features are better than others, you know, or more usable. They're easier to get right. The, the idioms for using them are, are easier to digest. I mean, the community is still trying to figure out how to use some of these things uh, really well. So it's kind of... Um, a self-selection where we're using features that make sense. Um, I don't think that probably we have production code that's using anything that's not actually standardized yet. Um, usually in the compiler flags, for instance, GCC and, and Clang, actual Visual Studio just gives you everything. It's like, it's turned on. By the way, you can use it. Um, but uh, GCC, for instance, you, you used to have to say dash std equals C++11. For a long time, that was C++ OX, because it wasn't actually a real standard yet. So 11, you know, once it was actually standardized, 11 will give you only those features. So you can say 11, 14, and also 1Y, which is really 17, or 1Z might be 19. So you can, you can kind of select how comfortable you are with some of these different things. But honestly, I would use 14 right now in production code, for sure. I mean. Most of the features that were implemented in it uh, were available even before 14 was out. So let's say 13, that's three years of, of production runtime. Uh, random tidbit, Google for its code base, uh, so says uh, Chandler Carruth, basically they build with Clang, he's one of the Clang maintain maintainers. They don't actually wait for a Clang release. They just build from the Clang trunk like every two weeks. And if all of their code, well, if all of the Clang regressions run and pass, and they build all of their code and it builds, and their tests pass, they're like, well, that's a good compiler. Whether or not they have you know, 1Z features turned on once they're using it, that's something else. But you know, they're really on top of the bleeding edge. So I, I understand why, in the past at least, the big uh, barrier to cross-platform standardization has been the Visual Studio compiler. You think like they're, they're stepping up their game? Or they get Microsoft is hugely on top of it now. Yeah. I think, you know, based on if you, if you pay attention to what Herb Sutter sang, you know, he was the, the chair of the Standards Committee for a long time, and, and he's, there was like kind of a dark age in the, for a while where Microsoft thought that managed code was, was fine and could do anything. And they actually thought, maybe we'll just rewrite the OS in, in managed code. And that kind of just totally failed. And they realized that was a bad idea. So that obviously, they're still investing a lot in .NET. It has its place. You know, C Sharp is, is not a bad language. Um, but they realized that the native code really matters. So they're heavily invested in standardizing. And their compiler rocks now. I mean, they, they have features like modules that that's where they're prototyping it, instead of just Clang. You know, it pretty much was that Clang was the place where everybody did everything interesting. Well, modules, um, I mean, concepts is in GCC, but Visual Studio is really uh, dynamic and on the edge now. So um, a lot of smart people work there, like STL and Herb Sutter and a bunch of guys. So it's, it's cool. Thank you very much.